I'm very happy to see all of you. Um, I um, was born in Germany. Uh, I lived in a village in the Black Forest, that's southeast, southwest Germany, near the French and Swiss border. And um, my father's family had lived in the village for several generations already. But before I tell you my story, I want to introduce you to some members of my family because I'll be talking about some of them. These are my great-grandparents on my father's side of the family. These are my grandparents, my father's parents, my grandfather, my mother's father, my grandmother, my mother's mother, my mother, my father, and this photograph was taken in August 1937 when my grandmother, my father's mother, had her 75th birthday. And there she is. And yours truly is over here with the bow on her dress. I was uh, 13 years old at the time. Uh, so I guess about almost your age. Um, when Hitler came, or before Hitler came to power in, on January 30th, 1933, I remember hearing my parents and other adults talking about Hitler, uh, saying that they hoped he wouldn't come to power. And I heard all of that. Uh, and then after he came to power, they said they hoped he wouldn't remain in power very long. And are you, you have trouble hearing me? Is this microphone working? Um, I'll try to speak as loud as I can. Um, and I thought, you know, this was just some adults talking and that it really didn't have anything to do with me. But just two months later, on Saturday, April 1st, 1933, I realized that indeed it did have something to do with me. On that day, there was a boycott of Jewish businesses. All of, yeah, this is better. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, there was a boycott of Jewish businesses all over Germany. The purpose of the boycott was to prevent Christians from uh, shopping in Jewish stores. And it certainly had that effect on that day, but it also had long-range effects. Because after that, Christians were afraid to be seen shopping in a Jewish store. And if you have a store and nobody comes and shops there, then you know what happens, that the store eventually goes out of business. Um, this slide, which was not taken in our village, uh, shows what that boycott looked like. This, this was perhaps a larger store because there are three Nazis standing in front of the store. And the sign over here says anyone who shops in a Jewish store is a traitor to the fatherland or a traitor to Germany. And my father and his younger brother had a business that my great-grandfather, the man that you saw in the first slide, started in 1858. Uh, and there was a Nazi standing in front of our store, in front of the Jewish hardware store, in front of the bake, Jewish bakery, the Jewish butcher. The um, next major thing in my life happened in 1935. My parents decided that I should leave the grade school in the village that I had been attending for four years and that I should go to school in a neighboring community where the educational level was somewhat higher. And I went with my father to be enrolled when the principal said, I'm sorry, but Katie cannot come to school here because you're Jewish. And my father didn't say a word but he pointed to a pin that he wore in the lapel of his jacket and wore it very proudly. Uh, and the principal said, oh, excuse me, I did not know that you are a wounded veteran of World War I. And in that case, Hetty can come to school here. And when I first started in that school, there were a number of Jewish children there, some of them from my own community. But over the next several years, the number of Jewish children decreased to the point where when I left that school several years later, 
there was only one other Jewish child and I in that school. And why was it that the number of Jewish children decreased? Because the families of some of these children were fortunate enough to be able to leave Germany. It was still relatively easy at that time to leave Germany. Um, and I'd like to ask um, a question of all of you, and you can raise your hand like this by, uh, in, in response to my question. If for some reason or other, you and your family would have to leave the United States, how many of you know someone in another country who would be able to help you and your family and maybe support your family financially for a number of years? Thank you. I'm just take. thank you. Uh, there are how many in here? 41, I understand, plus... Uh, okay, so there are about 55 people or so in here. And I've seen, if I counted correctly, about 10 hands that went up. In other words, those 10 of you who put your hands up, you'd be able to rescue yourself and your family. And the others, who knows what would happen to them. And that, in many ways, is what it was like for Jewish people in Germany. Not everyone knew someone in another country who could help. And as the number of Jewish children decreased, the anti-Jewish feelings amongst my classmates increased. They no longer talked to me, or if they did have something to say to me, it was to call me a dirty Jew or some other such name. Recess was perhaps the worst time of the day for me because no one would talk to me and no one would play with me. It's just another picture of the school. Several years ago, I was in that school and I gave a talk just like this one, only I gave it in German. And um, wanted someone took this photograph of me leaning up against this pillar in the front of the school. In the 1930s, during recess, that's where I stood, during recess, leaning up against this pillar, watching how the other children played with each other, talked with each other, uh, with each other but no one would have anything to do with me. I also had the great misfortune, the last two and a half years that I was in that school, I had a math teacher who was an SS man. The SS were the Nazi stormtroopers the Nazi elite, and he came to class almost every day wearing his black SS uniform, knee-high black boots, and in his right boot he sometimes had a revolver. And when he asked me questions, he would uh, either have his hand on the revolver or he actually pointed it at me. And no matter what my answers were, whether they were right or wrong, He'd ridicule me in front of my classmates and say, that's a Jewish answer. And we all know Jewish answers are no good. I was so afraid of this man that I was really not able to learn. And even today, I have problems, never mind with, arithmetic, with math, I have problems with very simple arithmetic. So later on, when you ask questions, Please don't ask me any arithmetic questions. <laughs> I do know that two and two is four, but I don't know a whole lot more. Um, the next major thing uh, that happened was in October 1938. Oh, I forgot. I'm, let me go back. Um, when I spoke in that school uh, several years ago, I told the children um, you know, this, this same story about this teacher. And I said, now that I'm here, where all this happened, I would like to get rid of this teacher because every time that I try to figure something out on a piece of paper or on a calculator, this man or this teacher walks across the calculator or he walks across the piece of paper and I just can't go on. And a 13-year-old raised his hand and said, this student way back there knows how to draw. Why don't you tell him what the teacher looked like and he can draw him on the blackboard? And that's what he was doing. He gave the teacher a whip also, which fortunately he didn't have at that time. And I said, well, now the teacher is present even more than before. What are we going to do about this now? And the same 13-year-old said, um, 
Why don't you pick up the sponge, step back from the blackboard, and throw the sponge on this drawing and see if you can wipe it out. Well, I wasn't quite successful in doing this, and so I handed the sponge to the 13-year-old, and he tried, and so did some of the others. And in the end, there was still a little bit left of this drawing, and so the 13-year-old said, I should now pick up the chalk and just scratch them out. And as I was doing this, all kinds of feelings came out of me that I didn't even know I had. Um, the next major thing that happened uh, was in October 1935. My grandfather, my mother's father, lived in a city quite some distance from us. And one day he was walking on the sidewalk when a Nazi came up to him and said, get off. Jews are not allowed to walk on the sidewalk. And so he walked in the street. And the same Nazi said, but Jews are not allowed to walk in the street either. Come with me, you're under arrest. And with that, he was taken to one of the city's jails. After spending several days in jail, he was told, if you promise to give up your home, your business, leave town, and never come back, we'll release you. And since he wanted so desperately to get out of this awful jail, he made that promise, but now he no longer had a place to live. He no longer had a source of income. And so he came to live with us. And at first I thought it was just wonderful having grandpa with us every single day until I found out why he was living with us and began to understand why he was so very unhappy. He spent several months with us. And then when he felt it was perhaps too much for my family, he moved on to my uncle and aunt, or his son and daughter-in-law, and who lived in another city, spent some time with them. And when he felt it was too much for them also, he moved on to a Jewish old age home, spent some time there, and then came back to us, and then to my uncle and aunt, and so on. I now want to move on to November 9th and 10th, 1938. That period has been referred to as crystal night or the night of the broken glass. But before I tell you what my experience was then, I want to give you a little bit of the historical background. About two weeks earlier, in late October 1938, the Nazis decided that Jews living in Germany who were either of, Ger of Polish birth or Polish ancestry were to be given one hour's notice to pack some stuff together they were then put on a train, and the train took them back to Poland. As soon as the train crossed the border into Poland, they were forced to get off the train, the train and the train went back to Germany. The, there was a Jewish teenager by the name of Herschel Greenspan, who lived and studied in Paris, France at the time. And his parents were in that group that was sent back to Poland. And he was so angry about this that he took it upon himself to go to the German uh, embassy in Paris. And he shot one of the officials there, a man by the name of von Rath. Von Rath died a couple of days later. And the Nazis used that as their pretext or their excuse uh, to take the first major act of persecution against Jews in Germany and Austria. Austria, by that time, had already been annexed to Germany. And what I'm now going to tell you is my experience at that time, which is similar to the experience of what happened to Jews in Germany and Austria, with some minor deviations. I left for school that morning, just like any other day. And I remember it was a very cold but sunny morning. On my way to school, I passed the home and office of a Jewish dentist. Every window in that building was broken. I didn't know why, but I assumed it is because the family is Jewish. But I continued on to school. Class started punctually at 8. At about 8.30, the principal walked in, and he talked to all of us. And then he suddenly stopped, and he pointed his finger at me, and he said, get out, you dirty Jew. And I heard what he said, but I just could not believe that this man, who I thought was a very kind, gentle person, 
his daughter was one of my classmates, that he would say something like this. And so I asked him to repeat it, and he did. But he also came over and grabbed me by the elbow and shoved me out the door. And as I was standing out in the hall, all kinds of thoughts went through my head. Like, what did I do? Did I fall asleep? Did I not pay attention? What am I going to tell my parents? And before I could answer those questions, the children came running out of the classroom, put on their coats or jackets. Some of them pushed or shoved me, others called me Dirty Jew and some other names. And then they all left. Where were they going? I had no idea. And so I went back in my classroom, sat at my desk, got out a book and tried to study. When there was a couple minutes later, there was a soft knock on the door and in came the only other Jewish child left in the school, a boy by the name of Hans Dolacher. Hans was a year younger than I and in a grade below me, and he had the same experience as the one I just described. And so he asked me, what are we going to do? And I said, Hans, go back to your classroom, sit at your desk and study, just like I'm doing. But Hans said, no, I'm scared. Can I stay here? And I said, sure but please be quiet because I'm trying to study. And then Hans said, well, can I go over and look out the window? And I said, sure, you can do that. But please do be quiet now because I want to study. And Hans stood by that window maybe an hour or an hour and a half when he suddenly became very excited. And he said, come here, look. And what we saw were men and boys, four in a row, chained to each other, chained to the ones in front of them, chained to the ones behind them, accompanied by SS who were hitting them with whips and urging them to walk faster. We didn't know who they were, but assumed these must be Jewish men and Jewish boys. And so we decided to call home. There was a bookstore right next door to the school where we used to buy our school books. And there was a phone there that we could use. And so I called my mother at home and a strange voice answered the phone and said, the phone is no longer in service. I called my father at his place of business, my grandmother, my aunt, and each time the same strange voice told me, the phone is no longer in service. Hans called his mother and some other people, and he too was told the same thing by the strange voice. And so we decided to go home. As I approached my home, and I took this photograph in, 19, in August 1947, when I was back in the village the very first time. And the house that I lived in is the one on the left. And you'll notice here, the shutters are closed upstairs or on the second floor, and they're open downstairs. When I left for school that morning, the green shutters were open. They were always open during the daytime. But when I came back that morning, a few hours after I'd left for school, the green shutters were closed. I went to the door and rang, and it was locked, and I didn't even know you could lock it. I rang the doorbell, but no one answered. And so I stood in front of the uh, house for a few minutes, trying to figure out, you know, what is going on? You know, how come nothing makes any sense today? When I saw a man walking towards me, and I knew he was one of the village's worst Nazis. <coughs> excuse me. And any other time, if I found myself, <coughs> excuse me, if I found myself on the same side of the street as he, I would cross over to the other side because I was afraid of him. But that morning, in my dismay, I went over to him and I asked him, do you know where my mother is? And his response was, I don't know where the goddamn bitch is. But if I find her and she's still alive, I'm going to kill her. And with that, I just took off as quickly as I could. Excuse me a moment. And no, thank you. No. I appreciate the offer, though. Later. Maybe. Um, and on my way, I passed the Jewish hardware store. The two display windows were broken. There were people milling around laughing and joking, and some of them were reaching in through the broken windows and taking out merchandise. 
I didn't understand that either, but I continued on. And as I got closer to the house where my aunt lived, and I took this photograph in August 1947 also, I saw my mother and my aunt looking out of this second story window. By the way, our store used to be right here. The name of the business used to be inscribed where you see this white uh, line, but uh, someone had, I guess, whitewashed it. And my mother opened the door and she looked kind of grotesque. She was taller and thinner than my aunt, but wore one of my aunt's dresses. And we both exchanged what, ha what we experienced since we last saw each other a few hours earlier that morning. And my mother told me that about 10 minutes after I left for school, some Nazis came to the house and they arrested my father. He was still in his pajamas. They did not give him an opportunity to get dressed or even to put a coat on on this very cold morning. And as he was being walked out the door, he said to my mother, try to find Hetty, try to stay together. A couple of the Nazis stayed behind they broke all the windows in the building, some furniture and some dishes. And after they left, my mother closed the shutters because that was the only way she could secure the windows, locked the door, ran down the street to my aunt's house, not realizing she was still wearing her nightgown. And that's why my aunt had given her one of her dresses to wear. The reason they were looking out of this second story window, and I joined them, was is because they had learned that earlier that morning, all Jewish men and Jewish boys beginning with the age of 16 had been arrested and taken to Village Hall. And you could see Village Hall in the next block over and on the other side of the street. And we were hoping to see the men and boys come out of Village Hall and come back home and come back home soon. And it wasn't long after I arrived at my aunt's house that I, we saw a group of people coming out of Village Hall. They were being marched down the street right past where my aunt lived. And it was exactly the same sight that I'd seen earlier that morning. Four men or boys in a row chained to each other, chained to the ones in front of them, chained to the ones behind them. But in this group was my father, and my uncle, and many other men and boys that I knew. My mother practically hung me out of that second story window and called out to my father, we have Hetty, we're together. Whether he heard or whether he saw me, we didn't really know. And we watched the group until they went around the bend in the road, and then they were out of sight. Where were they going? When would they be coming home? There were no answers to that. And so we closed the window and sat there sort of in numb silence for a few minutes when we heard loud banging on the door downstairs. When my uncle was arrested earlier that morning, no one did any damage to the building or its interior. But knowing what happened where we lived, we thought now they're coming to do the same thing here. And so my mother, my aunt and I ran up into the attic and the three of us hid in an old abandoned wardrobe up there. And I remember whispering to my mother, I want to get out of here, but not just out of this wardrobe. I want to get out of Germany. And I guess the reason I said I want to get out of Germany is because I knew that my parents had tried for several years to leave Germany, but had not been successful. How long were we in this wardrobe? I have no idea. It seemed to me at the time as though I spent my entire life in there. When it was quiet for quite a while, we thought it was probably safe to come back downstairs, and it was. And there was very little damage done to the building where my aunt lived or to our business. Um, we found out that uh, the people who were doing all the vandalizing were told to stop at noon and to move on to the next village and do exactly the same thing there. And they probably came to my aunt's house one or two minutes before noon. But there were several other things that happened on that day as well as in the next several days. For instance, Jewish children were no longer allowed to attend either private or public schools. 
Jewish businesses that were still open had, were, were closed. If you were Jewish and a doctor or an attorney, you were no longer allowed to practice. Uh, Christian doctors weren't allowed to treat Jews. Jews were not allowed to go to a hospital. In other words, a lot of the civil rights that you and I today maybe take for granted were permanently taken away from Jews. Most of the synagogues, the Jewish places of worship in Germany and Austria were burned down to the ground. The photograph on the right is the synagogue in, or the Jewish place of worship in the village where I lived. And I want you to pay particular attention to the two <laughs> tablets of Moses that had the Ten Commandments on it. This photograph I also took in August 1947, and that's what the synagogue looked like after November 1938. They did set it on fire, but very quickly extinguished the fire because the homes on either side were very close by and were Christian homes, and they were afraid that if they let the synagogue burn down, then these two Christian homes would also catch fire. But two men climbed up on the roof, and you'll notice the two tablets of Moses are no longer there. They knocked them off and they fell to the ground and shattered. There was a lot of damage done to the interior of the synagogue. The photograph on the right shows you what the interior looked like before November 1938. Uh, you'll see a, cup, a chandelier here and there's another one back there. And back here is where the Torah scrolls were kept. The Torah is the, perhaps the holiest of the holiest in Judaism. It contains the five books of Moses. The photograph on the left shows you what the interior looked like after November 1938. The two chandeliers are lying broken on the floor. The benches from upstairs were thrown down and they're lying broken on the floor. And back here where the Torah scrolls were kept, the ark is empty. Where, what happened to the Torah scrolls? They were taken to Village Hall and some of the men were wrapped in the Torah scrolls. But before they were later on marched down the street, they were taken out of the Torah scrolls. But when they arrived at the railroad station, the Torah scrolls were hung like curtains on the platform of the railroad station. But there's also good news about the synagogue. It, thanks to the mayor of the village, oops, I went too fast. Thanks to the mayor of the village, um, the, um, in the late 1980s, efforts were begun to restore the exterior and only the exterior of the former synagogue. About three or four years ago, the interior of the synagogue also was restored. But I also want to show you something else because in 1970, I was back in the village with my husband and my son because I wanted to show them where I once lived. And the photograph on the left is what the former synagogue looked like in 1970. You can hardly tell that it, the photograph on the left is the same building as the one on the right. During World War II, French prisoners of war were housed in the former synagogue. And sometime after the war was over, a large German agricultural firm purchased the building and stored some agricultural items in there, including manure. Just think of your own place of worship. How would you feel when you go there the next time you find manure in there? And I guess you could say they remodeled it a little bit. <laughs> um, but back again to 1938, um, there was no information for two weeks where the men and boys were, or even whether they were still alive. But two weeks after their arrest, the families that had loved ones arrested received a postcard, a pre-printed postcard like this. Um, thank you. Um, and the postcard came from the concentration camp Dachau. Dachau, by the way, was the very first concentration camp that the Nazis constructed in 1933 
soon after they came to power. In 1938, there were several other concentration camps in Germany, such as Buchenwald and Sachsenhausen. But the Jews, Jewish men and boys from the area where I come from were all sent to Dachau. Uh, the pre-printed part gives all the do's and don'ts. And the last line, it says the camp commander. Once we knew where my father was, and this postcard is not the one we received, but it's identical to the one we received. I just don't have the one we received. Um, once we knew where my father and all the other men and boys were, my mother decided to go to the Nazi secret police office, or Gestapo office, which was in a town some distance from where we lived. And I begged my mother, please don't go, because if you go and they keep you, I won't have a mother and I won't have a father. You see, I was so traumatized by the events of the, that time that I did not permit my mother or my aunt out of my sight. For instance, if one of us had to go to the bathroom, I absolutely insisted that all three of us go together. Since we couldn't get the windows replaced where we lived, we stayed at my aunt's house, put an extra bed in the bedroom so we could all sleep in the same room together. And my mother explained to me how very important it is for her to go to the Nazi secret police office, the Gestapo office, because maybe she can bring about the return of my father and some of the others, and maybe even the speedier return. And so she left early in the morning every day by train, came back late at night by train, but without any information until the Monday of the fourth week after the men and boys were arrested. And on that day, she was told that my father would return home this, during this week. However, if he's not back by Friday, he will never come back anymore because he's no longer alive. Mm. And on that very same day, the first few men arrived back home. We heard about it and we visited them. However, my mother did not allow me to remain in the room when conversation took place because she felt I was still too young. I was 14. But one thing made an indelible impression on me. Every man and every boy who came back had their hair completely shaved off, and I had never seen anyone look like that. The next morning, Tuesday morning, we went back to our house because, of course, that's where my father would come to. But he did not come back on Tuesday, not on Wednesday, nor on Thursday. And on Friday morning, I think my mother temporarily lost some of her sanity because she absolutely refused to get out of bed. She said, my husband is dead. He's no longer coming home. There's no sense my getting up. I don't even want to go on living anymore. And my aunt and I tried to prevail upon her how important it is for her to get up and to go back to our house. But it was to no avail. And so I asked my aunt, please accompany me back to our house. And my aunt said, I can't leave your mother in the condition that she's in. You can go by yourself. You don't need to be afraid. And I said, but I am afraid. I'm not going to go by myself. A few minutes later, there was a knock on the door downstairs. And for the first time in four weeks, I did something on my own. I went to the window and I looked out and called out, Daddy's home. And my mother said, no, 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 it's the Nazis. Let's go back up in the attic and hide in that wardrobe. But I went downstairs and opened the door, and there indeed was my father. You may remember I told you earlier that when he was arrested, they took him in his pajamas. He was now fully dressed. He even had a hat, wore a hat. And when I opened the door, he removed his hat. And I said, oh, my God. They shaved your hair. Now, I'd seen all the others that had come back earlier that week with their shaved heads, but this was my father, and I thought that he'd be different, but of course he wasn't. And he was so ashamed when I said this that he not only put his hat on, but he pulled it all the way, whoops, he pulled it all the way down to his chin. It took quite a while before my mother realized that the man standing next to her bed is her husband, my father. Once she came around and realized that he was there, that he was back, she urged him to get undressed and wash up 
and put on some clean clothes. But he was very reluctant to do so and explained, when I was in Dachau, I was beaten and my body is sore and swollen. The clothes they gave me fit real tight. When I take, if I'm going to take them off, it's going to really hurt some more. And so my mother got some scissors and she just uh, cut open the sleeves of his jacket and sort of peeled him out of that jacket. They both went to the bathroom. I did not go along, so I don't know how bad his body really looked. But later that day, my father had what was probably a mild heart attack. And as I mentioned earlier, Jewish doctors weren't allowed to practice anymore. Christian doctors weren't allowed to treat Jews, and Jews couldn't go to a hospital. But my mother somehow got word to our family doctor, who was a Christian, and uh, his name was Dr. Weber. And Dr. Weber uh, literally risked his life, and maybe that of his family, because every night, late at night, he came to our house, and he took care of my father, until he was relatively well again. You know, in a village, everybody knows everybody and knows where everybody lives. And had someone um, seen, the doctor, seen Dr. Weber come to our house and reported him, who knows, they might have sent him to Dachau also. He might have lost his life. And who knows what might have happened to his family. But I also want to share with you another side of Dr. Weber. Several years ago when I spoke in the village about my experiences, I mentioned what the story about Dr. Weber. And his sister, who was then almost 90, uh, was in the audience and she came up to me afterwards and she said, my brother died in 1953, but did you know that he was in the SS? And I said, no, I didn't know that. I never saw him in uniform. But when I came back here to St. Louis, I did some research and I found out that he joined the Nazi party and the SS very soon after the Nazis came to power. And during World War II, he conducted some pretty awful medical experiments on concentration camp inmates. Once my father was relatively well again, the efforts to leave Germany were resumed. But the focus changed. Until then, we had hoped to leave as a family unit. But it was now decided if one of us can leave, then that person will leave and hopefully the others can follow soon thereafter. And the opportunity to leave Germany presented itself to me on May 18, 1939, I left on a children's transport, or Kindertransport, as it was called. And um, there were about 500 children on the transport uh, that I was on. Um, the youngest were twins, six months old. The oldest were 17, and I was 14 and a half. Uh, we all went to England. Um, England took in almost 10,000 children, Jewish children, uh, in the nine months preceding World War II, and would have taken more except the war broke out and that was the end of the children's transport. This tag, which you may have seen in the museum, uh, I wore on a string around my neck as my identification, and I was child number 5,580. Some of us were placed in foster homes, others in institutional settings, and the oldest, the 17-year-old ones, had to start going to work right away. Most of them worked in agriculture. I remained in written contact with my parents and they with me until England declared war on Germany on September 3rd. 1939, then you could no longer correspond directly. But you could send 25 word messages through the Red Cross, and that's how my parents and I stayed in touch with each other. And then on October 22nd, 1940, all the Jews from the area where I come from, southwest Germany, were deported to a camp in what was then Vichy, France. France was already, already occupied by the Nazis, but Vichy France, the southern part of France, sort of seceded from the rest of France 
and collaborated with the Nazis. The next four or five slides that you see, that I'll show you, um, were allegedly secretly taken on October 22, 1940, in our village, the day of the deportation of the Jews. Uh, the man in the black coat and hat is Mr. Auerbacher. Uh, he's, his home is behind him, and he's about to be taken away on this truck. The man standing next to the truck is a German soldier. It's the same man following this. Um, behind him is his wife, and in the background you see some children who are watching. This is another family leaving their home. The boy coming out of the, whoops, out of the gate it was um, uh, 10 years old at the time. His name is Kurt Meyer. He's one of the few who survived. He now lives in Washington, D.C., and as far as I know, still works at the Library of Congress. His father is behind him. These are his grandparents, and they're going to be taken away on this truck. In the background, you see some people watching, and there are a couple here in the front who are watching. There is some, uh, some, you see some people are already on the truck. This man is carrying two suitcases. People were allowed to take 100 pounds of luggage with them, and I guess those two suitcases represent approximately 100 pounds. Uh, this is a German soldier, and this is another German soldier. There's an older woman struggling to get on the truck. Somebody's reaching out to her, giving her a hand. And in the back there, you see some people watching. There's even a cow. And cows don't usually walk on the street alone, so there was somebody with this cow, I guess. And uh, there's the next person that will go on the truck. As I mentioned, the Jews from this section in Germany, the southwest Germany, were sent to a camp, which is right down here in the lower left-hand corner of the map, called Camp de Gurs. There were several camps along the border here between France and Spain, which would be down there. Men and women were separated by barbed wire. But in the beginning, once a month, men and women were allowed to spend one hour together. And this photograph is taken on one of those occasions. Most of the people on this photograph are my family members. My parents are, that's my father, and there's my mother. Um, they still look pretty well, and because this photograph was taken very soon after they arrived there. I've seen photographs in the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. that were taken later, and the people looked just like mere skeletons. This photograph was taken in the men's section of the camp, and there were about 40 men there. And the only one I can identify is my father, his younger brother, my uncle, and an uncle of my father. And the others, I don't know who they are. Oops, I pushed the wrong button. In uh, March 1941, my father was taken away from Camp de Gurs and sent to a camp called Camp de Rives, uh, Camp de Le, Camp Les Mille, which is near um, Marseille, France. And then in July 1942, my mother was taken from Camp de Gurs and taken to a camp that's approximately here called Camp de Rivesalt. And uh, it was perhaps an aberration of the war, but my parents were able to correspond with me and I with them. However, they were allowed to write only one page per person per week. I could write as much and as often as I wanted to, but my parents never ever told me of the horrendous conditions under which they had to exist in these camps. And then I received a letter from my father dated August 9, 1942, in which he said, tomorrow I'm being deported to an unknown destination and it may be a long time before you hear from me again. And then I received a letter from my mother dated September 1st, 1942. And I'd like to read an excerpt from those, this letter to you. I, the letter is in German, but I translated it. 
And my mother writes on September 1st, 1942, my dear good Hetty child, it is very difficult for me to write to you today, but there's no use, it has to be done. And then she talks about mail that she received from me and then goes on. The last few weeks have been very upsetting for all of us, but especially for me. Your father was deported from Caen les Mille on August 12th, and unfortunately, I don't know where he was sent to. The last mail I had from him was dated August 9th, in which he expressed the hope that somewhere en route we would meet because a transport from here left at the same time for an unknown destination. But I remained here because your father lately was a forced laborer. But now there is another transport leaving from here, and this time I am leaving on it. My only hope is that I will meet your father somewhere, and then we will carry our lot, no matter how difficult it may be, with dignity and courage. My dear good child, I will try in every way possible to remain in touch with you, but it will probably be a long time before we hear from each other again. And then later in the letter she writes, continue to be always good and honest, carry your head high, and never lose your courage. Don't forget your parents. And of course I don't forget my parents, but I would like to ask each of you a favor, and I'm pretty sure you're going to carry it out. So let me thank you in advance. What I would like you to do is to remember at least one thing that I talked about today and share that with someone else, especially someone who's young. And in that way, my mother's last wish will be carried out long beyond the time that I am on this earth. So thank you for doing that. But back to my mother's letter. We shall continue to hope that one day we will see each other again, even if it takes a long time. My dear good child, let me greet you and kiss you heartily. I will never forget you and deeply love you. And then there was one more communication from my mother, a postcard dated September 4th, 1942. It's written in real shaky handwriting, and she's saying that she's traveling to the East and saying a very final goodbye to me. Traveling to the East in, 19, in September 1942 probably meant that you're traveling to Poland, that you're traveling to an extermination camp, and to your death. But I didn't understand that at that time, um, nor did I understand the final goodbye. This is the reverse side of the postcard. And normally, on the left side there, you would write your name and your return address. But there's nothing there. It's blank. Why? Because she no longer had a return address. And both my parents had written, it may be a long time before you hear from me again. And how long is a long time? Is it a week, a month, a year, 10 years? And since I wanted so very much to be reunited with my parents, I kept on telling myself, a long time isn't over yet, and I need to wait some more. And then in 1956, I received this letter, as well as this one. They're both dated uh, June 19th, 1956, They're from a French organization. The first letter pertains to my father. This one pertains to my mother. But they both say the same thing, that on uh, September 11th, 1942, they were sent to the concentration camp, Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. And in 1956, I certainly knew quite a bit about Auschwitz. And I knew that some people, a handful of people survived. And so I kept on hoping that my parents is in that group who survived. And then in 1980, in September 1980, I went back to Europe to visit the various camps where my parents were, and the last camp I visited was Auschwitz. And when I stood on this spot in Auschwitz in September 1980, this was the spot, by the way, where the cattle cars arrived and the spot where the people had to get off and Dr. Mengele and his cohort, cohorts made a selection as to who will live and who will die. 
those who were young enough and strong enough were given maybe an opportunity to live a little while longer while they were, per were performing very difficult work under horrendous conditions. But those who were too old or too young or too sick and weak were sent straight to the gas chamber and to their death. And my parents had been in a camp situation already for almost two years, so probably they were sent straight to the gas chamber. And so when I stood on this spot in September 1980, I was finally able to accept the fact that there was no way that my parents or other family members survived that time. In closing, I want to leave three challenges with you. The first one has to do with hatred. Hatred is what led to what I talked about today. Hatred is what led to Auschwitz. And hatred is a very, very ugly emotion. And it's destructive not only to the person or the group that you hate, but it's also very self-destructive. And why do we hate? We usually hate out of ignorance. We hate the unknown. We hate people who are different than we are because they have maybe a different ethnicity, they have a different, uh, speak a different language, have a different skin color, dress differently, speak with a foreign accent. And if you think you need to hate those people because they don't look just like you look, stop. And instead of hating, make an effort to get to know these people. There's a whole lot to be learned from people who are different than you. There's nothing whatsoever to be learned from hatred. Hatred only destroys. The second challenge is, has to do with choice or decision making. For instance, this morning uh, when the alarm clock went off or when uh, somebody woke you up, um, maybe you thought, oh, it's Friday, it's the end of the week, I, I think I'm going to skip school today. But you got up and you are here, and I hope you think you made a good choice. And every single day for the rest of your lives, um, and I hope there'll be long ones, um, you'll be making decisions, you'll be making choices. And before you act on those choices or those decisions, think about it. And if you think it's going to be detrimental to somebody else, it's going to be hurting someone, maybe even hurting you, then rethink it and hopefully you can make a better choice, a better decision. And the last challenge is, I'm firmly convinced that each and every one of us not only can, but must make a difference in life. And no one is too old or too young to do this. And you might think, well, you know, I'm only in sixth grade and what can I do? Well, let me just give you an example. Well, maybe when you leave this room, a couple of you are talking to each other and you're saying some pretty nasty things about one of the, uh, your classmates. And, and one of you, is, and another one of you listens to this. And you might just think, oh, thank God they're not talking about me. Or you might think, well, there's nothing that I can do. Well, there is something that you can do. And it's difficult. But you need to do it. And you need to go to those two who are saying these n mean things and say to them, I heard what you said, and it really makes me feel very uncomfortable. And I wish you would never do that again. And you won't know whether or not uh, they'll say it again, but they will, they will remember what you said. And in that way, you will have made a difference. I am done with my presentation. I do have one request, though. Normally, when a speaker is finished, the audience applauds. And I would like to ask you not to applaud. And the reason I'm asking you this is because if you were to applaud, it's almost like telling me, oh, isn't it wonderful what you talked about? And we're so glad that all this happened. And I don't think this is how you feel. So thank you very much. You've been a wonderful, attentive audience. And it, now it's your turn to ask questions. You know, tell me your name, when you were born, your parents, give me your background. Okay, I was born on August 15th, 1924 in Freiburg, Germany. Uh, I was the only child of my parents, uh, who are Ella and Hugo Wachenheimer. Do you want me to spell that? 
W A C H E N H E I M E R. And I took my first trip when I was eight, year, eight days old uh, by car from the hospital in Freiburg to the village where we lived, which is Kippenheim, K I P P E N H E I M. What was your life like? Um, my life. Well, I, you know, I remember one of the things that really stands out for me and, uh, is that I felt it was very unfair that my parents could punish me for things that they didn't approve of. Uh, and they did things that I didn't approve of, and I was not supposed to punish them. But I found ways of punishing them. Uh, I didn't know anything about Gandhi and nonviolent resistance, uh, but I remember one time I refused to continue walking, and I sat in the middle of the street, and I was not going to get up. And I didn't want my parents to car carry me. I was too old for that. But you know, I was probably seven or eight years old. Uh, and the ways I punished my parents, I'm ashamed now when I think about it because it was pretty awful. Um, but one of the very fond memories that I have, and I have many, is every unless my parents and I would take an all-day hike on a Sunday, uh, my Father and I would always take a, a shorter hike on Sunday morning, and my father would give me a topic to think about and to read up on or to ask people questions or whatever I wanted to do to get information. And then the following Sunday, we would talk about that. And I um, always did that. This was a very special time with my father. And when their wildflowers were in bloom, I would always pick a huge bunch of wildflowers and bring them home to my mother as a gift. Um, I remember the very last Sunday that my father and I uh, uh, took a hike, and he had given me a topic to, to, to think about um, and to talk to him about or discuss with him that following Sunday, and the topic was the immortality of the June bug. And I somehow decided that this was to be my sex education, and that really it was sex not so much mine, but my father. He wanted to know, and I was supposed to tell him. And I thought, no, I'm not going to tell him anything. So when we got together the, that last Sunday, and he said, well, uh, do you remember what the topic is? I said, yes, the immortality of the June bug. And so what does that mean to you? I don't know. I wouldn't say. And he said, well, what does immortality mean? Well, whatever, it does not die out. And so, and, and so you know, he sort of pulled it out of me. Uh, but I felt that I was supposed to educate him about sex. I didn't know any, not, I didn't know very much myself. Um, well, does that does that memory? Do you do you feel that that you this is so special to you because that is your last memory? That's what you have to hold on to. No, I mean there the, there are other things. I mean this is the the last Sunday that we w took this hike, uh, but there are all the other Sundays when my father and I took uh, this hike and t discussed whatever the topic of, was that he had assigned to me. Um, and I, I know this, this was very special for me to bring these flowers to my mother, these wild bouquet of wild flowers. And I know she expected it, and, and I knew she expected it, but it was sort of almost like a ritual, a ritual of love. And does that help that you have those good, warm memories? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, there are a lot of things that I don't know anything at all about uh, that, and I have no one to ask. Um, 
one of the questions, for instance, had things been normal, whatever normal is, um, and I had stayed in the village, who would I be? What kind of person would I be? Obviously not the person that I am today, because what the life experiences that I've had have shaped me, uh, and they would have been different ones. And I even one time when I went back in the village, I thought maybe I can find the answer to that question. But it's not there. It's just nice. And you know, and who were my parents really? As, you know, I, I know them as a child-parent relationship, but who were they really? And I, again, I don't know. I have the letters that my parents sent to me when they were in the camps in France. And they're very different. The content of those letters is very different than what my memories are of them when I was still at home with them. So who are they really? And again, I don't know. And you know, they were written at a time that was extremely stressful and difficult for them. And yet, you know, they were still trying to teach me things. They quote, uh, gave me citations from literature and. So they were very educated. Yes. Um, my parents were, and, and therefore I also, were outsiders in the community um, because we were not uh, religious. We did not observe any of the Jewish uh, rituals. Like we didn't uh, keep a kosher home. Although, you know, as long as there was still a Jewish butcher, we did buy there, but it wasn't because of the that meat was kosher because um, we ate out it wasn't kosher uh, we had dairy and meats mixed together uh, we did not go to the synagogue everybody in the jewish community there and it was a small community um, went to synagogue on friday night and on saturday morning and of course on the holy days and my parents only went on the high holy days and there was this discussion every year between my mother and my father when it came to the High Holy Days. My father would say, I'm not going to synagogue. My mother said, you gotta go. No. And my mother said, yes, you gotta go. No. And then they ended up going. But it was the same discussion year after year after year. And, and do you know why he didn't, you know, feel it was Well, I remember uh, 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 my father saying he was really troubled by the hypocrisy of some of the people. He said, you know, they go to synagogue and they pray, and on Yom Kippur they hit their fist, you know, with the fist they hit their chest and ask for forgiveness. And as they walk out of the synagogue, they're saying something very nasty about somebody. And, you know, why do you have to go to synagogue? And, you know, and then you come out and you are, uh, say these things. Do you did he know what was going on? Did he talk to you about, um, you know, he, I, the June bug and immortality? But did he did he talk to you about the Nazis and the Germans? Um, I mean, my parents tried to protect me to, to a certain extent. There were some things they could not protect me from. For instance, what was going on in school? And I'd come home and I'd complain about this math teacher. And I, I don't want to go to school anymore, to this school anymore. And my parents said, well, what would you want to do? And, you know, they didn't have an answer. I didn't have an answer. And so I went back to school the next day and the day after. And my father, who was trying to maybe trying to help me to deal with this, he said, you know, think about what you're going to do once you graduate from this school. But, and I, yes, that's wonderful. You know, you're going to go to Switzerland, the French-speaking part of Switzerland, or maybe to France and perfect your French. And, but when I went to school the next day and I had to deal with this teacher and with the kids, uh, you know, that was years away. I got to deal with it right now. That's not going to help me. And so I'd get angry, you know, with my parents. Why, you know, I wanted them to do it, take it away. And they couldn't, of course. And, you know, like when my grandfather came to live with us, they didn't say, tell me why, that he's, he's just going to be here. But then I found out, you know, by asking him and he told me. And uh, so, 
And you know what happened during Crystal Night? There was no way. They was there a warning before that? Well, I mean, my parents very early on realized that this is not a place to stay, and they were desperate to get out of Germany, anywhere, just out. Uh, and my father started to do genealogical research, and maybe somebody, some relative, distant relative, went somewhere, and we could find them and they could help us. Uh, and so we tried desperately. And there was... I never heard my parents say this or complain about it, but I have a real, I'm really angry with the Jewish community in Berlin uh, because they knew sometimes when there was an opening to go somewhere. Like, you know, people could go to Cuba, very few of them, but there was that opening. But by the time that information trickled down to a village, like where we lived in southern Germany, the doors were already closed. and. I'm angry that they didn't, they, if they knew there was an opportunity, let everyone know, not just the people in Berlin or in the larger cities. Now, my parents never, as far as I know, never mentioned that, but that's after the fact, my complaint. Right. So, um, so going up towards Kristallnacht, um, when did you have an idea of that, that something was going on. Yeah. Well, the night, uh, the night of the 9th of November, um, I remember my father, who always answered all my questions, uh, said to me, if we, just before I went to bed, he said, if you hear a strange voice to, uh, during the night, immediately get up and go in the hallway and go in the wardrobe there, hide uh, get inside the wardrobe. And I said, what kind of noise? Well, why should I go in the wardrobe? And he said, don't ask any questions, just do as you're told. And that was the f only time, the first time, that he didn't answer my quest questions. So he obviously knew something, which he didn't convey to me. And I went to bed and I laid there listening. What, you know, is there a noise? What, what am I, li and I didn't know what to listen for, really. And I finally fell asleep, and I woke up the next morning, and I hadn't heard anything, and there was nothing. And I think if my parents had known that something might happen, they wouldn't have let me go to school. So they, and I went to school, and they didn't give me any warnings or precautions. I just went to school. But then it was, it was that day, was that the, the day of Crystal Knock, was that the last day you attended school? Yes, I was, that's when I was kicked out by the principal. That was on the 10th of November, 1938. And there were no Jewish schools in the area where I lived. They then created some schools where there were none before. But, and there was one in the city about 30 miles away. But I did not go there. And the reason I didn't go there, because it was the low, for the lower grades. And I was already, you know, further along in my education. And, and it sounds like you pretty much, at that point, it became you and your mother and your aunt. Right. So there weren't any other people around that you were friendly with or that you... Well, I mean, we had contact with the other people in the community, but, you know, everybody suddenly became like their own little group, their own, and they we're going to stick together, we're going to support each other. We were all, each of... And everyone was frightened, and especially, you know, where are the men, where are the boys? When we first we didn't know for two weeks whether they were even still alive. And then when they started to come back, you know, the information came out, you know, so-and-so is back, so, so you visited them, you know. Did, did you see my husband? What did you see? How is he? You know, did you see my son, my brother, you know? Right. And you talked about, you know, being afraid, being afraid to go to the bathroom without your mom and your aunt. I mean, I was just afraid to, to move, you know, and I just felt I needed my mother and my aunt in my sight at all times. Then, you know, the three of us have to be together. And, you know, when I said, you know, let's say my mother or my aunt went to the bathroom, don't go without me, you know. Let them, my mother went, I, my aunt had to come too. We had to, all three of us go to the bathroom together. Well, 
It must have been so hard, though, when you went onto the kinder transport. How did they tell you? Whose idea was that for you to do that? Um, I don't know how my parents knew about it. Uh, or, or I've forgotten. I, that's also possible. Um, and my parents were saying, you know, here's this wonderful opportunity for they painted this beautiful picture for me. I'm going to go to a big city, to London. Uh, I'm going to learn English. I'm going to be able to go back to school. And always at the end of each sentence, they said, and we will see each other again soon. Whether they believed that, I don't know. I certainly did. And I had no reason not to believe it. But once, uh, when England declared war on Germany on September 3rd, 1939, I knew that soon isn't going to happen. I'm going to have to wait until the war is over. And when is that? How long? You know, I had no idea. And I sort of almost put all feelings and hopes, like wrapped them up in a package and put them on a shelf to be taken down when the right time comes. And I didn't allow myself, I think, to really feel what I was feeling. I just tried to, you know, I insulated myself from all feelings. So that's how you survived those years. Right. And I think that's, had I not done that, I think I may not have, I, mean, I don't know that I would have died, but I would not have been able to, to I mean, it was a survival mechanism for me. So tell me, um, getting on the kinder transport, walk me through through that and the families that you were with. With the family that I lived with? Yeah, tell me how, when you got, did you know ahead of time who you Well, I knew the name of the family and the makeup of the family and the address, but that's about all that I knew. And, um, and I knew who would pick me up, not the family, but somebody else who would pick me up. Uh, at the Liverpool Street, Liverpool Street Railroad Station. Um, and um, we were in this huge, I, I really remember very little of the entire trip. Uh, I think I just, there were so many feelings I think that I had that I blocked out everything else. There wasn't room for anything else. Uh, the, that, you know, we were in a compartment in the train. There had to be other children there. I do not recall a single one. Um, I got on the train in Frankfurt, Germany. And um, the next stop was Cologne, where more children were going to get on the train. And I remember nothing between Frankfurt and Cologne. In Cologne, I remembered this steep, this huge cathedral and this tall, tall steeple of the cathedral. And I had written a letter to my parents um, and gave it to somebody on the platform because I didn't have any stamps. Which, and they, uh, my parents received that letter. And then the next stop was in Aachen, Germany, A-A-C-H-E-N. And that's right on the border between Holland and Germany. And there's some more children got on the train. Um, but again, I don't remember anything. And then the train stopped shortly afterwards, after we crossed the border at, in some, I don't remember the name of the community in Holland. And there were ladies on the platform who gave us cookies and juice. And those were the best cookies ever. And that apparently is not only my impression, but I've talked to others who've been on a kinder transport, and everybody talks about these good cookies. And I think the only way I can explain it is I think it was the first act of kindness, and so they became the best cookies. They were probably just ordinary cookies. And then I remember seeing these huge fields of tulips, every conceivable color, Tulips, tulips everywhere. I do not remember getting off the train in Hook Van Holland. I do not remember getting on the boat. I obviously did. 
I do not remember getting off the boat in Harwich, England. Um, I do remember the train from Harwich to London, but it's a train that doesn't exist and couldn't have existed at that time. I, the train had swivel chairs, and I remember sitting on a swivel chair and going around and around and around. And I think, really, there were so many thoughts and feelings in my head that I made a swivel chair out of it. There was no such train. I know, I know that, but that's what I remember. I remember a train with swivel chairs. And uh, then when we arrived in uh, London, we were taken to this huge hall, and it was announced that our names would be called alphabetically. And my name started with a W, my last name, and so I knew it would be quite a while. And there were about 500 of us on this particular transport, um, ranging in age from twins, six months old, and the oldest were 17. I was 14 and a half. And I, remember I sat on my suitcase and I guess I fell asleep. And I woke up at some point and there was hardly anybody, any children left. And I started to cry and nobody's here to wait for me. And somebody came over and said, you know, why are you crying? What's your name? And oh, we called your name and you didn't answer. And I was asleep. <laughs> and there was somebody there waiting for me. And she spoke to me in English, which is, I, had, I didn't understand. I knew a few words, but not enough to understand. And she took me to the subway and there was this huge, huge escalator. And she went ahead and I was supposed to follow her. Well, I had my suitcase in one hand and I had one of those pillbox hats with uh, elastic under the chin, but the elastic broke. So I had to hold it in my hand because it would, wouldn't stay on my head. And I had, somebody had given me some, uh, a book. Uh, the, the train had stopped somewhere in Germany. Somebody had given me a book. And I don't know what else. My hands were full of all kinds of things. I had an umbrella. And, and so I'm supposed to get on this escalator. I've never been on an escalator. And I, I got to hold on both hands on the railings, but I what about all the things I have? This woman was already da way down at the bottom there, and she's motioning, you know, to come. And I finally put all my things on the, on the steps of the escalator. And, you know, people were coming, and I told them to, to go ahead. You know. And I put all my things on there, so that now my hands were free. And so I held on to the escalator, to the railings. And I made it down, all the way down. And there came this roaring train, a red uh, tube or subway. And we got on, and she was talking to me, but I couldn't hear, I couldn't understand. And we're traveling underground, and we're traveling, and we're traveling. It seemed endless. Finally, we got above ground. And where were we? I had no idea. We're still traveling, some more stations. And finally, we got off, and it turned out to be the very last stop on that line. And then we took a taxi to the, the family that I was going to stay with. And um, the lady of the house was there. It was nobody else was there. They had three children, 19, 14, and 11. But they were in school at the time that I arrived there. And so there was tea and some pastries or something and they and the two women were talking in English and then the woman that took me there left and then I was shown my room and told to un, you know unpack your I mean sign language you know unpack your suitcase and um, and then the children came and so it was I, you know they looked at me you know, tried to talk to me and I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> and then the husband came later on, and then I got my first meal of several, which, which consisted of two pieces of toast and butter and uh, a cup of tea, and that was my dinner. Um, and I ate by myself. The family ate afterwards, and I was told to go out in the yard and look around while they were eating. 
And for six weeks, that was my diet, two pieces. Why do you think they did that? Um, I mean, they, at first I didn't understand the explanation. I just, I didn't know. Uh, but as my English got better and I understood more, they told me that I was starving in Germany. And now that I am in England and I see there's lots of food, uh, I want to eat everything and lots of it. And for health reasons, I, it's not good to do that. So I need to gradually increase my diet. And for six weeks, three meals a day, each time two pieces of toast and butter and a cup of tea. On Sunday mornings, I got something else, and it's an additional. Uh, the husband of the family apparently uh, got up before everybody else got up and made tea and then in the, served the tea and a cookie to everybody. And I shared the room with the little girl who was about my age. And so he also gave me a cup of tea and a cookie. So that was the extra that I got on Sundays. So, did someone, so someone came and checked on you and that's why No, you? nobody came and checked. The, the lady that uh, brought me there, um, I, knew, I knew ahead of time because of correspondence that between her and my parents that um, I arrived in England on a Thursday and that she and her family and her mother and brother and whoever else uh, were going to, on their regular summer vacation to France and wouldn't be back until the fall. And so I wouldn't, shouldn't expect to hear or see her during that period. And, but she came back, or the whole family, that whole family came back sometime in July because of the imminent threat of war. And she called me one afternoon around 4.30, and by that time I could speak some English. Um, and she asked me, how are you? And for the first time ever, because other people had asked me, like the teacher in school or so, and I, they asked me, how are you? Fine. But when she asked me, how, how are you? I said, hungry. And she said, what time is dinner? And I said, it doesn't make any difference. And, well, what, what are you saying? And I was afraid to speak because I'm in the home. And, and she realized that I was, had some hesitation about speaking. And so she said, well, why don't you come and visit us uh, on Saturday, come for lunch, and then we can talk. And I said, I can't come. And she said, why not? What are you doing on Saturday? And I said, nothing. Well, why aren't you, why can't you come? And I said, I have no money. And she said, well, don't you get an allowance? And I didn't know that word I didn't know. So she said, don't you get a shilling? And I said, no. And apparently that's what I was supposed to get. And um, so she said, let me speak to the lady of the house. And I thought, uh oh, now I'm in trouble. And I called her to the phone and they talked for a while. And then I was put back on the phone. She said, well, she's going to give you car fare and the directions how to go. And then you come on Saturday and we'll talk. And I came there and I never stopped eating. I, everything that was there, I ate and you want some more? Yes. And finally she said, you know, you can have as much as you want, but really, you know, you, you're going to get sick. And I said, yeah, but tomorrow and the next day, I don't have it, all of this, so I have to eat ahead. And so she said, well, I'm going to try and find another placement for you. And school will be out the end of the month. So I'd like you to stay with this family because I don't know where, I'm going to, where you're going to be placed next. And I want you to finish the school year. She gave me some money and she said, on the way to school and on the way home from school, buy yourself something to eat. Don't say anything to the family, though. And be sure you don't have any leftovers somewhere near your mouth. And um, I, every day on the way to school and back home, I bought Cadbury's milk chocolate with hazelnuts. That's how I supplemented my diet. And uh, then uh, she picked me up and took me to this next family. And I was not to tell the family anything, but not to discuss it with them. And also not to have any further contact with this family. And I didn't, so I don't know what 
was what they were told. And the second family knew what happened. And so they almost force fed me, eat more, eat more. And the, the first family was probably financially fairly well off, just judging by the house they lived in and their lifestyle. Uh, the second family was quite poor, lived in a very poor, actually I was still in the same school district so I could continue school in the fall. Um, but they were willing to share and, and, the, and both families were paid for my stay there. What I seem to remember, but my, that may be false memory, that they got one pound, but I don't know if this was one pound a week or one pound a month. I, I don't know. But that memory may be false. I, I don't know. And then shortly before my um, 16th birthday, I was told um, in England you only have to go to school until you're 16. And um, so you will have to drop out of school and go to work. And I was, you know, I, I haven't finished high school. How do you find a job? What can I do? I have no, I have no skills. I don't know a trade. I don't know anything. And so this woman found this job for me with a cantor who was separated or divorced, I'm not sure which, from his wife. So the wife was no longer in the home. And he had a 14-year-old daughter who lived with him. And I was to be her companion walk her to school, pick her up from school, help her with her homework, and just dust the furniture, and that was... And I had, you know, you know and free board and lodging, of course, and um, the food was good. <laughs> and, uh, and I got five shillings a week, and I thought I was on my way to being a millionaire. Because, you know, what were my expenses? You know, maybe to buy toothpaste, but you don't buy that every day. You know. And then from there, so you're 16, you're out, you have to get a job, and um, so how, how did you end up, tell me how you ended up in Nuremberg, though. Um, after the war was over, I mean, I stayed with this family only a very short time because there were some other problems there. He had, we, a shelter was built because the heavy air raid started right about the time I arrived there. and. Um, he had a girlfriend and there were some things going on there, which I didn't understand what, the, what that was, but I, it frightened me. And so I was taken away from there. And I was placed in a, what was called a girl's home. Uh, we were all refugees and the so-called girls were all in their 20s and 30s. I was the very youngest when I got there. After that, they took younger ones also. Um, and I, uh, the matron of this girl's home was a German Jewish woman who really exploited all of us. Um, some of them worked outside in wherever different places uh, though, and some of us worked within the girl's home. She had a doll factory there so we were, uh, learned how to make dolls, how to make doll clothes. Later on she branched out to making children's clothes and, um, but there was no pay for this. I mean, we, because we got, we lived there and we were fed, and so that was it. And our mail was always opened in case somebody sent us money, that was taken out. I mean, nobody ever sent me any money, but uh, some of the girls had relatives or, or somebody who would send them money. And, um, our food really, I never, we never knew what we ate. It was sort of gray mush. It all looked the same. She had a special meals cooked for her, which were brought, she lived on the third floor of one of, there were three buildings and she lived on the third floor of one of the buildings. And we could see those trays of delicious food being brought up from the kitchen, which was in the basement, all the way up to her. We could smell it maybe, but. We got gray mush. And uh, there was a sick bay there, uh, but you really had to be on your last legs, I think, in order to get there. And I lived in a room with seven others. One of them was a young woman who had been in Palestine 
and contracted malaria and then had come to England at some point. And she was really quite ill. She was not allowed in the sick bay. She was considered a malingerer. And one morning we woke up and she was, had died during the night. I mean, obviously not a malingerer. Then, you know, why didn't we tell the, how sick she was? Well, we did. You know. And she was too sick to get up and get food, so we stole some of that gray mush and brought it to her so that she would have something to eat. Um, and at some point, and I think it was in 1943, um, a couple of other girls and I decided we've had it. We're not going to continue working here and be exploited. And, we got it to, and we've learned how to sew. Uh, so we applied for a job and, at Harrods department store in the department where the clothes were made for the present Queen of England and her sister. We were not allowed to touch those things. There was one woman that was her job to make those clothes. And then I decided I really needed to do something as far as the war is concerned. And I left Harrods and worked in a factory, in a munitions factory, and was there until the war was over. And, and then very briefly, I worked for an organization that was sort of like a tracing service. Um, and I, in July of 1945, I left for Germany to work for the American government. I had a contract for one year with the U.S. Civil Censorship Division. We were censoring incoming and outgoing German mail. And um, it was boring. I'm reading other people's mail. We were supposed to look for codes. You know, was, if, if there was any, I never found anything. I mean, you know, maybe somebody wrote, Grandma's coming to visit on Sunday. That may have been a code. Maybe Grandma really was going right. to come. I don't know. And you got this job just because you were fluent in German. Right. Uh, I uh, wasn't 21 yet. And when I had, you know, first I had to take a test, a history test, a German test, then the physical t a test, and got all the shots that were necessary. And okay, you're set to go, but oh, but looked at, they looked at my father. You're not yet 21 you have to get permission from your parents. And so I explained that I don't know where my parents are. I didn't say they're no longer alive, but I don't know where they are. Well, then you must have a guardian. No, I don't have a guardian. You've got to have a guardian. No, I do not have a guardian. Well, then you're just going to have to wait until you're 20. And, and I said, no, I want to go now. I'm ready to go. I want to go now. And I begged and I pleaded and they said, okay, you can go, but don't tell anyone that you're not yet 21. When I was 21 in Germany, I had a big party, and everyone knew I'm now 21. <laughs> um, but I, after, I, before the contract was up, I realized I want to stay in Germany longer, uh, but I don't want to continue doing this. And I found out that Nuremberg was looking for people, and I applied. And the, this was at the time that the international trial was still g going on, the trial of the Goering and Rudolf Hess, conducted by the former Soviet Union, Great Britain, France, and the United States. Uh, but the United States already knew or had decided that when this trial is over, the United States will conduct several more trials in the same palace of justice and they were beginning to hire people for that purpose. And I applied, and I was assigned, I didn't ask for it, but I was assigned to the case of the Nazi doctors who performed medical experiments on concentration camp inmates. And um, I didn't know that there were, exper that experiments had been conducted. I didn't know anything about the kind of experiments I was totally, totally unprepared for what I was getting into. And most of the time, I was not really in Nuremberg, but in Berlin, where there was a former Nazi document center. And that's where we were looking for the documentary evidence. The document center was in the suburb of Berlin, in Dahlem, 
D A H L E M. Um, it was deep underground, and there were two ways of going down, uh, either by elevator or stairs. The man in charge of the document center was an army, a U.S. Army colonel by the name of Helms, H-E-L-M-S. He, his sympathies were not with us. His sympathies were with the Germans. He was, came to the United States in the early 1920s. His brother was a high-ranking officer in the German army during World War II. So that explains where his sympathies were. And he made life very, very difficult for us. Um, soon after we got there, the stairs were bricked shut, so there was only the elevator. And somewhere upstairs, someone controlled the electricity. And at times, there was no electricity. So we couldn't get in or couldn't get out. We had no electric lights. Um, there was, because it was so deep underground, there was some kind of a ventilating system that didn't function. We didn't need a canary because it was never off that long. Um, but he was trying to prevent us from doing our wor work. And so we brought flashlights, and that's how we did during those times when the power was off. We complained to Nuremberg about this, and they said, well, the document center is under the auspices of the army, and we are the War Department, and we can't tell the Army what to do. So make the best of it. Documents disappeared. For instance, there was a card index of everyone that ever was a member of the Nazi Party, that ever even applied to be a member of the Nazi Party, uh, who was in the SS and when they applied. And so. The card for that um, Colonel Helm's brother was nowhere. He had taken it, obviously. Um, we locked some documents in a drawer with, and took the keys with us. Somehow they disappeared. We could never prove it, that he was responsible for it, but you know, who else would have taken it? And what were your responsibilities? My responsibility that? was to look for the documentary evidence to be used in the medical trial. And those files were in terrible disorder. When we arrived there, um, they were, the files had been taken out of the folders that they were in and were in cardboard boxes on the floor. Whether uh, the Nazis, and this was done by the Nazis, whether they were going to evacuate these or destroy them, I don't know. But they were still there. And there were American soldiers who didn't speak German, who had the responsibility of putting those files that were in the cardboard boxes on the floor back in the files and then on the sh put them on the shelf. And then what they did is they just grabbed as many files or papers as they could, put them in a, do in a file folder, put the file folder on the shelf when it was full. Next one. So, you know, we found maybe page two and five of a document. Well, where's page one and three and four? Sometimes it was found, sometimes it wasn't. And you had to go very meticulously through each piece of paper in these files because you never knew what was the next one. And while you were doing this, did you did it feel like you were getting justice for your parents? No, I didn't feel that at all. It was just, I mean, it was just overwhelming. I, because I was not prepared, I didn't know that there were experiments conducted and they were described in great detail and with, without any compassion. I mean, as though, you know, I polished this table and, uh, you know, it, it was just, I mean, I, sometimes I literally gag, I vomit. I couldn't sleep at night. I couldn't eat because I was so upset about this. And one time I found a list of names of people that were to be sent to Auschwitz. And I went through the list. And it, again, it was alphabetical. So I was looking for my family names. And I found my father's name on the list. But I discounted it because 
my the, the date uh, for this um, list was uh, February 1942, and I was still in written contact with my father until August 1942. So, no, he couldn't have been sent to Auschwitz. Now, whether that particular list had something to do with him later on being sent to Auschwitz, I don't know. Um, so, in in some ways, doing this work was also a way of maybe I can find out something about my parents. And that was the only thing that I ever found. Um, I spent, of course, some time in, Bur in Nuremberg and sat in on some of the uh, court sessions. And it was just, you know, witnesses came who survived, who testified about their experiences. And I remember one young woman she could no longer walk because of what happened to her. And she uh, described what happened to her and was then asked, do you see anyone here in the courtroom who did this to you? And she pointed to this one uh, defendant who was the only woman the defendant in the case. There were 23 defendants. And this woman, the defendant, I mean, her face was just a total blank. Later on, this defendant, this um, pa, um, Hertha Oberhäuser is her name. Do you want me to spell it? That's okay. um, she was asked why she did what she did. And she said, well, they were just Polish women and they were going to die anyway. I mean, just no compassion, no remorse no responsibility for what they did. Um, one of the defendants, and he was not a doctor, but he was involved in the administration of all of this, um, he was so nervous and so afraid that he literally almost wasted away. And he wouldn't eat the, whatever the prison food was. I don't know what it was. And so he got a special diet so, but things that he liked so that he could survive, uh, he received the death sentence. So, um, seven of the 23 received the death sentence. Seven were um, released because, not because they were not guilty, but we couldn't find enough documentary evidence or witnesses, and so they were acquitted. And uh, the others received sentences ranging from 10 years to life sentence. Those who received the death sentence were hung in uh, Landsberg, the same prison where Hitler was and wrote his book, Mein Kampf. Uh, the others, regardless how long their prison sentence was, after about five years, were all released. Uh, why? This was at the time of the Cold War, and it was more important to fight the Soviet Union than to have these people live out their sentences because maybe they have some information that we can use. It's, and some of them came to the United States. Uh, this woman, that a doctor that I talked about, for instance, she, had, she received 20 years sentence, was released after about five years, practiced as a uh, pediatrician. In 1960, her license was revoked because some of the women that she experimented on, and she wor uh, worked in Ravensburg, which was a women's concentration camp, some of the women survived, and they approached the German Medical Association and said, this woman's license has to be revoked. And so it was in 1960. Uh, and I understand she then worked in a hospital in the kitchen of that hospital. What she did there, I don't know. So if you had to sum it up, you know, I mean, what, what a strange circumstance, events that took you from Germany to England, back to Germany. Well, I, part of the reason that I went back to Germany, applied for to work in Germany, is because I wanted to look for my parents and my family. Uh, and it, I think I really, in my head, I knew my parents didn't survive, but in my heart, in my soul, I couldn't admit to that. And if I had really believed that they survived, 
I would have gone back to Kippenheim, the village where I lived right away, and looked for them. It took me two years before I went back there. One time prior to that, I was actually on the train to go there, but when the train stopped the first time somewhere, I got off and went back to Nuremberg. And um, finally, in August 1947, I went back there, and of course they weren't there. No one had returned there. There are no Jews even today in Kippenheim. And the synagogue, which has been uh, restored, uh, is not really used as a synagogue. It's, there are several events taking place throughout the year in the synagogue, but all of them have some kind of Jewish content. I myself have given uh, talks inside the former synagogues, I don't know, several times already in the last several years. So when, how long did you stay in Germany? Until March 1948. Uh, by that time, the medical trial, the trial of the doctors was over. Uh, and then I was assigned to sort of help out here and there where there was, where they needed someone to work. And in March 1948, I left. I mean, they said that's, the, the other trials were winding down also. And um, I left to go back to, and I had to go back to England. I really wanted to, had decided I wanted to come to the United States. And I thought I could leave directly from Germany to the United States. But the American consul had said, no, your place of residence is England. Although I didn't, my place of residence was where I was, which was Germany. And so I had to go back to England and I applied for a quota number. I had a, um, uh, an affidavit from my aunt and uncle, my mother's brother and his wife, who had come to the United States in early 1938. And I get, the German quota was wide open at that time because the Germans needed to be denazified, etc. And so I got my visa very quickly. And uh, I, at the end of May 1948, I came to the United States, to New York City. Can I? Okay. Yeah, take a drink. Yes, <laughs> Oops. Oh, okay. Uh, I know, a lot, a lot, a lot to talk about. Um, yeah, you have a little, little bit of Okay, that's good. Um, your aunt and uncle got out in 1938. Why did they get out and your family didn't? Uh, my aunt's brother had been in the United States for several years already, and he gave an affidavit to my uncle and aunt. My uncle and aunt uh, both worked and had marginal incomes, and uh, they, um, they were able to give an uh, affidavit to my parents and to me uh, it was not sufficient. My aunt worked as a chambermaid to some rich lady, and that lady gave the supplemental affidavit, which was really the major part. Uh, my parents had registered with the American consulate in Germany very soon after Hitler came to power and got a relatively low quota number. When that number was called, and I don't remember when that was. It might have been 35 or 36. We didn't have an affidavit. And so my parents had to re-register. By that time, a lot of people had registered. And so they got a very high quota number. And uh, they were again to go before the German, I mean, the American consulate in Germany in November 1940, but they were deported in October 1940. I went before the American consulate in England, and I got a visa for six months, but there was very limited uh, passage available on boats because the boats were needed for the war effort. And so when by the six, or before the six months expired, the visa expired, I didn't renew it because there was still the same problem. And so, I, and then in 1948 it was, wide open and processed very quickly. So how was that to, to come over when, when you did and you came, uh, tell me about 
I mean, uh, I stayed with my uncle and aunt, and they never had children. Um, and uh, so I was maybe the child they never had. And of course, the last time I'd seen them in 1938, just before they left, they came to visit us to say goodbye. I was still a child. And I think they thought I was still that child. And they treated me almost that way. And uh, I was no longer a child. I was 23. And both of them were working, but they did not want me to go to work because I said, you know, I'm going to have to get, start to work. No, 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 you don't need to work. Whatever you want, you know, we'll give it to you. And my aunt got upset because I made my own bed. You don't have to do this. I do it. You know. Uh, we were eating and we were finished and I picked up my plate. No, don't, 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 don't. And every day, my aunt and my uncle, each of them, brought me a gift. And I said to them, you know, I'm not used to this much love anymore. I know you mean well, but I can't accept it. I can't deal with it. It's too much for me. Please stop. And they couldn't stop and I couldn't handle it. And I said to them, I want to have an ongoing good relationship with you, but it's not going to work. At some point, I'm just going to, probably going to explode and scream at you, don't do this anymore. And so I'm going to move out. And they were very upset, please don't. And they thought that you know, I would never see them again. I did move out and I, of course, continued the relationship with them until their respective death. You can understand, they were feeling guilty, you know, that you had lost Yeah, I mean, they were trying to make up for what I lost, but I, you know, I was not used to it anymore, and I, to this kind of overwhelming love. And, and what, you know, you, you were talking to the kids today, which um, I want you to tell me, um, in, in talking to the kids, it kind of does bring back that you were a kid, that when this all happened Well, to you. I mean, I gave a talk last night at, to some Hillel, at Hillel to some students. And at one point, I suddenly I couldn't I didn't know where what where do I go what what did I just say where what's the next thing because some, it happens to me sometimes it didn't happen today but it happens sometimes I'm back there and then I don't know oh I'm not there I'm here in this room but what's the next thing I'm supposed to say and there's for a moment, I just, I don't know. And then what I do is I just click for the next slide or something, and then that tells me, you know, where I am. Right, but which is, which is the point of being so impressionable. You were such an impressionable age, you know, um, at 14, having to go through all that and lose your parents. But you see, I didn't really accept that until 1980, where I was able to say my parents did not survive. I mean, I was in denial, and it was a, a survival mechanism for me. I, I, I don't know whether I would have gotten mad or what, I don't know. I mean, for instance, in this girl's home where I lived in England, there were, and I don't know why some of these things happened, but some of the girls stole things from other girls. It was, you know, maybe that represented love to them something that they didn't have that the somebody else had. I don't know. There were some suicides. You know, probably wouldn't have happened uh, had things, quote, been normal. Right. And so I just put all feelings aside. You know, I'm going to have to wait. My parents said, it's going to be a long time. So a long time isn't over yet. So when you find, in 1980, tell me how you came to that realization. Well, uh, I visited the various camps where my parents were, and Auschwitz was the last camp that I visited. And when I stood on that spot, which was called the ramp at that time in the 1940s, where the cattle cars arrived, people had to get off, and Dr. Mengele and his cohorts made a selection as to who will live and who will die. There was nothing there that really reminded me of my parents. But that's when I was able to say, no, your parents did not survive, nor did your aunt, nor your uncle, and so on. And some of their family did not survive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Let's
much. I just want to go back over a few things that you said to the kids. Um, first, I want you to tell me about um, why you decided to talk and why you like talking to the kids. Okay. Uh, I started, I gave my first presentation in uh, 1970. My son was in junior high school at the time, and they were covering this period of history. And so he said to his teacher, my mother lived through some of this. And the teacher said, you know, do you think she'd come and talk to the class? And he said, I don't know, I'll ask her. And so he was my first agent. <laughs> uh, and so I came to the class and I talked to them. I didn't have video or slides, or, but I brought a whole bunch, I brought all these photographs, all the letters from my parents, all kinds of stuff that I brought with me. And then this teacher asked me to come the following year again, and the following year, and then the word got around the school district, and the world has, word has gotten around, I guess, a much larger area because I've spoken all over the United States. I've spoken in Germany, in Austria, so. And, and what does that do for you, being able to speak? Well, you know, my mother in her last letter says, you know, don't forget your parents. And that's to me like a mandate to talk about it. And, uh, and not only to talk about it, but to ask the audience to remember just one thing. I mean, they can remember more, but at least one thing. And share that with somebody else and share it with somebody who's young. And that way, my mother's last wish to not be forgotten will be perpetuated. And so I feel I'm trying to be a good little girl who listens to what her mother asked her to do, and that's it. And what do you hope that these kids do walk away with when they walk out of this building or out of the lecture? I don't know what they walk away with, but I, it's happened to me a couple of times that uh, I was in a totally different setting, nothing to do with the Holocaust. Uh, and somebody would come up to me and say, you know, you made a big difference in my life. And I'll say, how? Well, who are you? What did I do? And well, you talked to me when I was in high school, and I've never forgotten what you've said, and it has shaped my life, it's made a difference. And so you never know what, you know, and you don't always know. And, and how do you equate that? Because I go back to what you were saying to this kid about being in school, and being so afraid and wondering, why is this teacher, this principal, whoever is being so mean to you? The teach. I mean, I had the principal. I had good feelings about him until the day of Crystal Night when he kicked me out of school, and I couldn't understand why. I mean, he's always been kind and good and friendly. His daughter's one of my classmates. Um, the math teacher. Uh, I mean. You know, I realized he's in the SS, he's doing his thing. Uh, the other teachers, while they, they were not, none of them were evil or nasty to me. And for some of them, I even felt like they felt sorry for me. They knew what I was, had to deal with, but couldn't help or did, were afraid to help. And so I had good feelings about all the other teachers. But there was this one teacher for two and a half years the same teacher, except during that period for, I don't remember for how long it was, maybe a month or so, that he was away on some training or something, and we had a substitute teacher, and I was learning, because he was fine, he, you know, there was no problem. like the fact that as, as a child you were made to feel bad and they did humiliate you, did that have a lasting effect on you to, for the rest of your life as how you relate to people? Uh, I think the lesson that I've learned from this is to not do what happened to me to anybody and not only not do it but also when I see something is happening regardless whether this, this is happening to Jews, to Christians, to Muslims, to, who, to a human being. 
then I need to do what is in my power to try and alleviate that situation. Fully aware I can't do everything. And in some instances, no matter what I do, it doesn't really make any difference. But I still have to do that. That's my responsibility. I don't want someone to later on say, and why didn't you do something? Do you wish there had been people I'm sorry? Do you wish there had been people in your town doing yeah. that for you? Well, there was one woman, a very simple farm lady, who was different than the other people. Um, we used to get our butter and milk and eggs from her, and my mother would always go there in the evening, and sometimes I'd go with her. And this was maybe in 1936 or thereabouts. And I happened to go with my mother that evening to buy whatever we were going to get. And this farm lady said, I'm terribly sorry, but I'm going to have to ask you not to come anymore because my oldest son, Bernard, has joined the Nazi party. And if he finds out that I'm selling you these things, I don't know what he will do. Uh, but I'm going to try and bring you whatever I can when I can. And she did that. And, you know, in 1947, when I was back in the village, uh, the word got around that I'm there. And so all these people came out of the woodworks, and they were all my parents' best friends. I didn't know my parents had that many best friends. But this farm lady wasn't anywhere. And I asked whether she was still alive and whether she still lived in the same place. And she was still alive and lived there. So I went there and I visited her and I thanked her for what she did at that time. And she cried bitter tears saying, I wish I could have done more. And I said, Mrs. Novak, you've done all that you were able to do and nobody can ask any more of you. So don't blame yourself for anything. That's nice. I'm glad you went back. That's very nice. Um, I think we've pretty much covered everything. Um, yeah, is there anything else that you want to tell me? Well, that's, I guess they can go on and on and on, but I think there's time to end maybe. And I thank you very much for okay. all you're doing. Thank you.